we had a three-part roundtable conversation that some of the challenges you may be experiencing, you're no different than me. There is someone there that looks like me, like representation matters. Having come from a time where I was the only black person in the building till today where we've got diversity unlike we've had in the past, it's exciting. Thank you so much for being here um, for the Black History Month Roundtable. I would love for each one of you to take a moment to introduce yourselves. I'll start with you, Gil. Gil Beverly, Chief Marketing and Strategy Officer for the Titans. I just finished my fourth season. Awesome. Rand Carthon, General Manager, and I'm starting my fourth week. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Uh, I'm Adolfo Birch. I am a Chief External and League Affairs Officer. Uh, I've been with the Titans since uh, July of 20 but was with the league office for 23 before that. You're the senior veteran of the group. <laughs> um, so just talk a little bit, Gil, we'll start back with you about the journey to get to where you are today. Sure, um, for me, I started out after college working in healthcare, because um, I was told that was a good field to get into. <laughs> and it was, except for the fact that I just wasn't interested in healthcare. So <laughs> the field was good. <laughs> exactly. The field was good, it just wasn't for me. Gotcha. And so I'm like 25, 26, I'm like, what, what, do I, what am I interested in? What am I passionate about? And you know, as a 25-year-old young man, there wasn't a lot there, but sports really stood above the rest. And you know, I was naive enough to figure, okay, if I just knock on enough doors, um, I can start a career in sports. So I went back to the college I graduated from, UPenn in Philly, um, and volunteered at the athletic department there for about half a year, and then something came open. Um, so I worked as director of basketball operations uh, for the basketball team there for uh, three years. I went back and got my MBA in sports marketing. And then from there, I uh, got jobs at the NFL League office, um, a long stint at ESPN, um, and eventually here at the Titans. Awesome. Great. So, I guess it goes back. I grew up in football. Uh, my father played eight years, coached for 19. Uh, got my start collegiately at the University of Florida. From there, I bounced around the league, uh, most notably with the Colts. Uh, got my start in the front office in 2008 with the Falcons. Uh, worked there for four seasons. Uh, moved on to the Rams. I was there five, season to uh, five seasons total, four in St. Louis, one in L.A. Uh, from there, spent six seasons with the 49ers um, and just recently got hired here, like I said, in my fourth week and, um, you know, excited to really get started. Awesome. Adolfo? Well, uh, my story is probably a little bit different because uh, I backed into it. Uh, I started out, I came back to law school. My singular focus was to be mayor of Nashville. That was my job, my, or at least my goal. Uh, but at some point, my dad sort of talked me into really actually learning how to practice law at some point. Thought that might, might be good to, to know how to practice. Uh, so I went to some firms in, uh, in Houston. Uh, while I was there, when the team decided uh, they was gonna relocate to Nashville, so I kind of raised my hand and said, hey, I kind of know some people in Houston. I know what's going on here. I know what's going on in Nashville. Could I kind of be on a transition team? Uh, and that went sort of nowhere. <laughs> so, but as a result, I somehow got into a hat uh, and I got a call about the, the job I ended up taking at the league office in New York. Uh, so, you know, it wasn't by design, uh, but, you know, it was, it was great that it happened because it, it has been a journey and I know most of us here love the sports industry, love what it's about and love being a part of it. And I haven't looked back since I, since I changed. It's really cool for me having been at the a part of the organization for as long as I have to be sitting at the table with three black men in leadership positions because for so long I was the only black person in the building. And so it's really like almost emotional for me to sit at the table and, and feel like I can have this level of conversation. I think in the past it was almost something that you just didn't talk about. It was, I was painfully aware of it every day, but it wasn't a conversation that you could have specifically like within the walls of the building. And so I guess, you know, when you think about your journey and some of the adversity you may have encountered and 
and what you learned from it and how you grew from it. I would love to hear some of, some of that from you all as well. One thing I think is, there's a story I, I tend to tell people is that sports and in particular football is just different. Uh, it's different than any other business, different than any other industry. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, with the, my, with the things I did at the league office, they tended to be the ones where somebody would be reading about it the next day or you'd be hearing about it on the news or every person who is at a water cooler and thinks they understand what's going on is, you know, giving you their commentary on talk radio. Uh, and, you know, during one particular uh, issue we were dealing with, it was just getting to me. And, uh, and, you know, I thought it was partly because I think there were some issues about who they thought was making the decision and, and some of the sort of aspersions that people were tending to, to put, you know, uh, sort of my way particularly, but it's really part of a, a bigger issue. It's just a lot going on, and I, I got that. But at the time that I was sort of at my wits end and exasperated with the whole thing, I ended up, I got a call from my aunt. My aunt was, at the time, she was probably 75. Uh, and she just immediately started launching into me about why the Texans were still running a 3-4. And she just didn't understand it. She's a big Texans fan. And, and she just didn't understand it. And, and it was 45 minutes of that. And so that, to me, helped just ground me in the whole reality that, look, even when you think it doesn't matter to you, it matters to everybody. Mm -hmm. And so that help me just from a, you know, when things come up that are tough or things come up that you just, you wish you didn't have to deal with, you just remember how much it matters to all the people around you who would give anything yeah. for the opportunity to be a part of whatever it is you're doing, so. Yeah. Oftentimes that get lo gets lost in the work. You forget exactly. how exactly. valuable and important and, and the representation, like there's a million people that are looking at even your worst and most adverse moments, like wishing they were sitting in the same seat. So, Gil? Um, if you're talking about challenges and adversity, you know, that are unique to us as black men or to, unique to me, like I'm sitting down, but I'm six foot six, right? So I'm a large black man. And so as a result, like, you know, people's reactions to me run the gamut and I have to be prepared for all of it. Like there's some folks that I scare just from walking into a room. There's some folks that like are fascinated and they want to be my homeboy when they meet me because whatever, you know, and whatever that means to them. And that can go a lot of ways um, and really anything in between. And I think, you know, understanding that you run into situations where you might be one of the few people that the person across the table from you even knows who's a person of color or who's maybe not dealt with the person of color um, from a business standpoint, as an equal, as a colleague, whatever. And <clears throat> you have to be ready for that and just understand that that person's uh, ability to relate to you might not be what you might want. And it might not necessarily come from a negative place. It's just they don't have that experience. And more times than not, that's what I run into. It's just the lack of experience and sort of, uh, and I don't mean this in a super negative way, but an ignorance. It's ignorant because yeah. they just don't know um, versus like overt hostility. Yeah. But, you know, having to bear responsibility for that interaction where you kind of feel like you have to teach this person who you are and what you're about and how it's really, you know, we're still just doing business at, yeah. the, same, at the end of the day, just like you would do business with someone else. You know, there are times when I think people can get fatigued with that but you know it's just something that you kind of have to learn to deal with you want to you know stay true to yourself don't feel like you have to change for anybody um, but at the same time it's a dynamic that is different for me than it might be for you know someone else yeah and I want to come back to something you touched on um, those difficult conversations I would love to come back to that but first I want to give her in a chance to for answer. me it's uh, you know for the sake we're in the locker room right now right so having been in a locker room I feel like the locker room in all sports is the safest and most uh, accepting group of any organization, right? You know, and then if you think about our game, it doesn't matter what your race is, your socioeconomic status, for those four hours that you're cheering for your team, that's all that matters is your like-mindedness of the team. And so with that said, it's the opposite end, you know, being, you know, the first black GM in franchise history and 
like I said in my uh, opening press conference, I wasn't aware because I wasn't searching to be the first black, right? I was just trying to earn this job and be the best. And something that my aunt, you know, she brought to my attention. And then it was sort of a full circle moment. Uh, I remember back when I first got into scouting, you know, I'm, I've always been the type, if I don't have the answer, I'm gonna go find it. And I remember just reading through all the GM's bios and the one that stood out to me the most was Jerry Reese's. He was the GM of the Giants at the time and he had specifically in there a quote that it meant a lot to him to be a black GM and to do a good job and leave the door open, you know, for the ones coming behind him. And I just reached out to him just based off of that quote that I saw and was able to sit down with him at an all-star game and pretty much shadow him. Even though I was with another club, just shadow him and just talk to him about his thought processes of being in that position. And then now I find myself, you know, in that position looking to do the same, you know, for the for the guys that are coming behind me. So uh, for me, it's kind of, you know, I've been on both sides of the coin, right? And then especially with all the initiatives that are being put in place, you know, to level the playing field, to give, you know, more men like myself opportunities for, for these roles. Like even me being in this role, having met Adolfo and Gil, um, not Gil, uh, Burke and, you know, Miss Amy um, at the Accelerator Program, you know, like that's where I was first introduced to this organization through a league initiative about giving us more opportunities to be in this role. So, um, you know, again, it's, I think, and I, I don't want to speak for um, everybody here, but uh, I think it was intentional. You know, it's, it's a difference, to, it's a different thing to show up and say, hey, we took part of the accelerator program. But I think the group from this organization was intentional about meeting with people and finding Ooh. people. And I think that is evident if you look at the interview list of who they interviewed, I think it was intentional. That's awesome. I think, you know, it's interesting because oftentimes, like, I'll go places and I'm sure you get the same thing and people will be so proud. Like when I go to, whether it be a TSU or a HBCU or I go speak to a group of people, they're always like so proud of me or so excited to see me because representation matters so much. And I'm always like, I'm just Tina. Like, <laughs> what? Like, You're never just Tina. <laughs> you don't, Come on. You don't know me. I'm mm -hmm. just Tina. But then I'll, I'll step away for a second and think, man, how amazing would it have been when I was those ages and someone like me came to inspire me? You know, how I feel it, it's just amazing to be able to be in a position and on a platform to be able to do something that encourages someone else. Like, so I've learned how to sit in this and be proud to be mm -hmm. in the position that I can use this platform to, to give to someone else. Like um, when you think about like the young black men that are maybe listening to this, what, what inspirational word or advice would you provide them? I'll jump in because I was just thinking about what you just said, how you're just Tina. Right. Like that's all I've ever wanted to be is me. That's the only person I know how to be. But I've always taken pride in just I don't have to be out front. Right. I'm not looking for it. I just want to do my part in the overall, you know, scheme of everything we're doing. And so being here in Nashville and going different places, whether I'm looking for a place to live or just going to um, get something to eat, you know, just, you know, the, the black community here has been so supportive you know, and just coming up and, you know, tapping me on the shoulder, hey, c congratulations, welcome, we're happy for you, you know, and it's, it's feeling it and it becomes a, a sense of responsibility, but it becomes a, a motivator as well, right? Because like you said, there are now kids' eyes are opening to the possibilities of, right? When you're, you know, six, seven, eight years old, all the way through high school, all you know is what you see on the football field. You see coaches, you see players. You don't know about a Gill. You don't know about Adolfo. You don't know about myself because those aren't, you know, those positions aren't represented, you know, on TV on Sundays and Saturdays. And so, you know, now hoping that these kids will see this and see us as inspirations, they can see that, you know, not everybody's going to make it. I mean, though the numbers are what they are, but there are other positions within organizations that you can be in, thrive, and still res uh, live your dream of being in the NFL. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think. You know, I usually tell a story for folks who are looking to break in, and I just I kind of raise my hand and just say, hey, who here has worked or works in fast food? And just see how many people raise their hand. I said, how many of y'all like it? 
you know, and uh, that answer is usually zero, right? <laughs> but, but then my, the third question I'd ask is, okay, what if I told you you could own the McDonald's in five years? Like, do you think that you would pay more attention to how to make the fries? Mm -hmm. Or pay, you know, do you, what do you think your attitude? And, that, and, and so to me, it's just a metaphor to talk about attitude and understanding, you know, Ram mentioned it earlier, it's constant effort to learn. Uh, and so if you can approach those things, you know, whether it's your career or your personal life, whatever it is, in a, in a, from a sense of wanting to learn and just figure it all out, uh, I think that's the single best thing you can do uh, to help you kind of chart your path uh, because you have to be prepared to do things that don't seem like they're the, you know, yeah. they're that fun or it's not automatically the, you know, you know, you're not the first day at a job in the NFL, you're not walking out in, onto the stage at Super Bowl. You know, going to not tell Rand who to draft. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So you just have to, you know, it's, it's like understanding that bigger picture and that longer term play. And the, and the other thing I do is I always talk about people being, you're, everyone is a leader to someone. Everyone is an inspiration to someone. And so don't, you know, look at yourself as merely somebody who, tries to get inspiration from others or tries to, you know, tries to figure out what I can learn from this person, try to figure out what you can teach to that one. You know, try to figure out what things you can do, where you can go, how you can go talk to your elementary school, how you can do things that help you to develop that skill set that will ultimately help you personally uh, in your career. So uh, to me, that's, you know, that's the, if there's one sort of thing that just, fits underneath all of it, to, it's that to me. Um, I'll go quick. I mean, for me, I think, you know, I love Rand's story because what I was going to say is have a vision for yourself and don't ex accept the limitations. So for Rand, it was like, I'm trying to be one of these GMs and so I'm going to learn about them, I'm going to find them, I'm going to follow them, and I'm going to figure out my way to get there. And I think, you know, that's really a great example for all of us. And, you know, for again, taking it back to the race factor, we don't have as many you know, we don't always have the prominent role models to model ourselves, you know, from. So sometimes you have to write your own story, but at the end of the day, you can do it. Don't accept the limitations that, you know, real or perceived. You know, I'm one generation from the hood on one side, uh, two generations from, you know, the fields in Mississippi yeah. on the other side. And so, you know, that's it for whatever I have now, it's a big leap from that, yeah. you know, I mean? <laughs> so like, you know, so it can be done. And so, especially these days, so just don't accept the limitations, have that vision and just be relentless at working towards it. Yeah. So I wanna shift just a little bit, like the conversation thus far has been about what we're saying to the black community, how we're encouraging members of the black community, but we, because of where we are, we have a responsibility to help others understand. And so if we, if the goal, whether it be within the Titans organization, in our communities, if the goal is to grow and to progress from where we are to where we would ultimately like to be, those conversations have to extend beyond just the black community. Um, each one of you are in positions of power and have opportunities to have conversations with individuals. And so, like, I, I would love to know your thoughts and when you're navigating those difficult conversations, not with members of the black community, but outside of that, what does that look like for you? You know, I think if you find yourself, you know, if I'm following your question, in a situation where you have to maybe explain something that is, you know, racially charged or whatever the case may be, you know, I think what I try to do is to start with creating a safe space. So, you know, if it's, you're responding to an incident in a meeting, maybe you wait until after the meeting and you pull somebody aside yeah. and sort of say, hey, you know, I know what you were trying to do there, but you might look at it this way, you know, like I had one person told, tell me once before, like, you know, the, the classic trope, wow, you really speak well. <laughs> Thank <it's> like, you. <laughs> you're so articulate. Yeah, exactly. Wow, it's you're like, so well spoken. And it was, <laughs> <laughs> good job. Well, it was said in a way, like if you saw like a, a puppy ride a tricycle or something, like, whoa, that's crazy that that happened, right? You know what I mean? And like, it's like, well, you know, I know you were trying to. I know you're well intended. Yeah, but, but that didn't come off great, you know, and it's, and so it's really pulling the person aside, understanding, assuming innocence and the intent. Um, most, like I said, most of those types of errors are unforced and they come from an, a, a place of ignorance rather than hate. 
and you cannot and you typically can tell the difference yeah. um and if that's the case then you try to respond to that with kindness and from an educational standpoint versus um, aggression yeah you were gonna say something no, well you know and look at the articulate thing is funny because i remember my old uh <laughs> folks at the league office we had a running sort of bet. It was like, every time you hear the word articulate, ask, is it being said about a black person or a white person? And I would get a point for every time it was said about you know, one, and they'd get a point for the other. Are. And it, it, after a while, it just gave up. Because yeah. at some point, it was like 100 and something to two. Or, you know, and I was like, so you, but it, it was useful even then. Like that, in a way, it was the same sort of thing. It was showing through an extended, you know, send it sort of play out the same point. Yeah. That you're not you're not understanding why you're saying that. Let me show you the impact of what you're saying. Like why is that occurring to you? Why is it why is it you even thinking to remark about Yeah. How many times do you Man's been to grad school. <laughs> like you know, what are you doing? What, 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 I don't get it. Yeah. How many times <laughs> what do you <laughs> critique how someone speaks? <laughs> exactly. It's like, how how often up? is that? And so, you know, so I think you do things like that, you know, you for me, I one thing I do try to do is I try to just sort of say some stuff. Uh, occasionally, because I, I feel like you can, if you can just, it, almost like an icebreaker, right? Just to get it on the table, uh, because I think sometimes everybody's kind of tiptoeing close to it, but if somebody can just, you know, break glass, then now you can have a conversation and everybody can say, okay, I get it, you know, I see what's going on here. Um, so to me, those are the main two things. And then I try to make sure you you get people out of their comfort zones potentially even when you don't have to and I don't mean that in a bad way I just mean that as you know we may have a talk let's say we're, we're talking and we're talking about frats or something and there might be some people there that aren't really familiar with the black fraternity experience <laughs> right. but that doesn't mean I'm gonna stop talking yeah I'm gonna still talk about it because after I finish hey, now you're gonna learn something you know a little more than you knew right you know and and so you, you can't be you you have to get it out uh, as at least to the start, and maybe that you know generates a question and response. Maybe that generates some wanting to learn some more, and you know maybe they can go see my old step show tape and show them how I do. I've it. seen Ooh, it in I person. Need to, <laughs> I need to see that. <laughs> oh, you all need to see it. <laughs> it's something to see. At some point, do you ever feel like you are tired of having to have that conversation? I there was an actor recently that came out and said he doesn't want to be recognized as a black actor wants to be recognized as an actor. Like he doesn't, he's like, you know, you don't go to McDonald's and say the black manager. You, you go to McDonald's and ask for the manager. And so oftentimes that feels like, like a heavy lift. At some point, do you ever feel like you're the first black general manager? Do you want to be recognized as a general manager? And understanding that, like, how do you navigate like moving from being that label to just being good, you're here because you deserve to be here, you know? Or as you hear people say, I have a seat at the table. I deserve to be here. I mean, going back to the, the original question and coming back to that one, I've always been, what Adolfo said, is the person that, you know, just breaks the, the ice with the conversation, particularly as it pertains to race. Um, I don't want this to sound crazy, but I think one of the benefits of George Floyd's murder and the timing of it forced us all to be more willing to have those uncomfortable conversations that for so many years we glided over, right? Unless it came in your direct path. You know, it was the pandemic, we were all locked down, everybody was forced to be in their homes and you couldn't leave your homes and we were all forced to watch that eight minutes and 46 seconds, right? And then what came out of that, you know, all the different organizations I'm assuming had these, these Zooms and you know, you heard the, I, I had no clue, I didn't know. And, and you know, I, I understand that, but because at those times it didn't affect your status quo. Yeah. But now that you're in your home with your children and it's all that's plastered on the TV, it affected the status quo. Yeah. So it forced us all, you know, to have those conversations. And particularly with what I do, you know, 70% of the product that we put out on the field is black. And so we have to be willing to have these uncomfortable conversations in the, in the draft room. Um, and you have to have a more of an understanding of the culture, 
right? Because there are some things culturally that you might not understand when we're reading through the character of these young men that may be a problem for you culturally. But coming from where we grew up, you have a better understanding of it, and it might not be a thing. Um, but to the, the second part of your question, you know, again, and I'll, I'll forever say it, like I never intended to be the first black, right? Because, you know, in all honesty, if you ask the question to a broad audience, who was the first white GM in Titans history? Couldn't tell you, right? Because that person never set out to be the first white, right? So why should I set out to be the first black? I want to be the best. I want to be the GM that's a part of the group that brought the first Lombardi here. You know, when it's all said and done and I'm 100 years old, I want my name out in the lobby. You know, I don't want it to say first black <laughs> with my name. I just want my name up there. Yeah. Hopefully with a Lombardi trophy or two. You know, I'm not going to go LeBron or three or four <laughs> or five. <Yeah>. But Easy. <laughs> right, right. But, you know, that's, that's how I've always, you know, approached everything. Yeah, I think, you know, you asked, are, do you get tired? And, you know, I think the honest answer for me is sometimes, but, you know, it's just part of it. We all have our things that we have to deal with. But, you know, to kind of piggyback on what Rand said, at the end of the day, it's about, like, I know who I am and I know what I'm trying to do. So, like, yeah, there's this other piece that I have to deal with because I'm black or whatever. Um, and I don't shy away from it. I'm proud of who I am. I'm proud of where I came from. But professionally, I know who I am, what I bring to the table, and I'm focused on, you know, putting myself in the position to excel at my job and at my profession and my craft. And if I do that, then, I, you know, things tend to work out, yeah. I guess is how I look at it. I'll interject one more time just to thinking about it even more. You know, Mike Tomlin was the first black in Pittsburgh. Ozzie Newsom was the first black GM, period, in the league but both of those guys are winners. And so you don't hear about nothing about their race now. All you hear is Tomlin's never had a losing season. Ozzie drafted X amount of Hall of Famers, two Super Bowls. So I think when you're in this position, when it's new, you know, that's the, that becomes the label, but I think we're in total control of how that label can change and shift with our performance. But, but to that point though, I, was just, I just heard this the other day, somebody was mentioning uh, some of the coaching prospects, and they're like, oh, everybody's looking for the next, you know, name, name whoever you, which tree you want to run down. He's like, but why is no one ever saying, I need to find the next Mike Tomlin? You know, I mean, he's got a, his record is stellar. Yeah. Right. Uh, but, you know, they're not seeing it that way. We're saying the next, you know, where's the next Ozzy? You know, like that's, you, you, you still have to be sort of persistent in making sure people are, you know, comparing themselves properly at, or comparing, you know, among folks properly to give everybody that due that they really deserve. Because, uh, I mean, Mike Tomlin, as, as that example, is just bar none. Uh, but it just never gets quite mentioned in the same way. How do you change that, right? Like, to that point, see like, it. how do you do that? How do you convince people that we need to see him for all the successes he's had and he deserves to be mentioned in these circles. How do you, how do you start to convince people that that's the direction we need to go? Uh, well, look, I, I, I think back to the main point, you know, winning in, in this business, yeah. <laughs> the, winning, the winning speaks. And so, you know, unfortunately, <clears throat> if you're not, win, you know, it's like you, when, you, when you hit your highest high point, you're in everybody's mouth. Yeah. But maybe when you, you know, taking a Band-Aid crew and getting them to respectability and, you know, showing performance and effort and all the things that a great coach does when, you know, the team might not be at its best, you don't get, you just, people aren't talking about it in that same way. And I, I, I think people need to talk about it in that way and, and say, understand what this means, understand what that means. You know, we have our examples here. We got, we had, you know, the, the, the coaching performances have been great and that's because of the work and that's because of all the people involved and we have to talk about it like that. But you just said something earlier though, I agree with everything you just said, but like Mike Tomlin is a winner, right? And yeah, to, well, to yes. your point, yeah, well, I, I agree with that. You know, a big that. part of it is, you know, where the leaders above Mike Tomlin and how are they, what are they bringing to the table? And so the Rooney family, I don't know them, but yeah. they have a great reputation for being progressive and for, you know, Absolutely. running a meritocracy and, you know, you know, Mike Tomlin, 
they took a chance on him when they hired him, right? You know, it's hard to remember that, but he was kind of a, a, a underdog for that role, um, and, and they, they hired him. Um, you know, we've Amy Adams Strunk. I mean, she has the, the leadership that allows for this table to it's exist, happen, right? Yeah. And so, how do we fix it? It's putting more folks like Rand in the positions that he's in, um, and folks that uh, have, you know, if not, you know, literally representing, you know, black folks, um, folks with open minds and people willing to, you know, again, we're like, sports should be the ultimate meritocracy. You can either ball or you can't. You either win or you don't. And so, when you let the other things seep in, that's when you have, you know, less than stellar outcomes. And so you need to find, we need more people in the places of power to have that mindset. For me, it's always, and I, we talked about this in my interview, is it wasn't necessarily about just getting a GM job, right? It was about getting the right one, the right fit that will allow you to A, B, you, and then support you. Right. Because there were other opportunities um, and, you know, the folks at the uh, 49ers were super supportive, but I always let them know that, hey, don't automatically assume that I'm taking every job interview that comes through. Right. Having lived through my father being one of the original Rooney Rule guys and lived through his stories of hearing, you know, the man you look up to say, son, I have no chance at that job, you know, and hear that over and over and over and not understanding and then having that tough conversation, you know, with him, like, you know, damn it, you're going to stop what you're doing and explain to me, you know, why that is. And when he did, I had a better understanding. So I always took the approach of I'm not taking every interview. It has to align with who I am, what I believe, because as much as you're interviewing me, I'm interviewing you too. Right. And not every opportunity is going to be the same. And, you know, I had, several interviews just throughout all the years and you could tell 30 minutes into it like yeah this probably isn't going to work <laughs> you know and again you know having those conversations with my family like hey I know we said we want to be at this role but if they offer me the job I'm not taking it yeah. you know because you know I think Martin Mayhew may be the only black GM to get a second chance yeah. you know and the number of how many ever we've had and so it's GM as a whole, you know, black or white, you don't get a second chance usually. And so it was always about, you know, the right fit for me and having met with the group, you know, I felt the instant connection when we had the interview to the point that Adolfo asked me, I don't know if you even remember this, the interview was over, he's like, no, hey, what'd you think? I was like, that was easy. And he was like, wait, wait, hold on, <laughs> hold on. And I was, you know, more so meant it, not the interview in and of itself, yeah. But it was a conversation, right. right? It was never, yes, they were doing their job and interviewing me and asking me these questions, but I just felt like we were just free flowing in the conversation. It was, was never, I had to be here and, you know, nervous or anything. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much. This is like very personal and meaningful to me. I will like when my son was in middle school, he, I remember him coming home and I would hear his friends, he and his friends would have a, a say and they would say, we stacking up. You know, I had no clue what it meant, but every time a new black kid came to their school, <laughs> they would say, we stacking up. So seeing y'all at this table, it feels All good right. to say, we stacking, we stacking up. up. Uh, stacking <laughs> up. But thank you guys so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.